Now, Finland has been named the world's happiest nation for a seventh straight year. The UN-backed World Happiness Report looks at life satisfaction in 143 countries and territories across the globe. Denmark, Sweden and Iceland also continue to top the leaderboard, coming second, third and fourth place. But this year, there has been a significant slide down the rankings for Germany and the United States, mainly due to the gloomy outlook of younger people. If you're looking for good cheer, you'll likely find it here, in Finland, the world's happiest nation for the seventh year. You'd be forgiven for thinking there must be something in the water. But researchers put it down to Finn's own life satisfaction, as well as social support, health, life expectancy, freedom, generosity, and GDP. Finnish people most probably are happier because they can rely on a good institution, so meaning um, a well-functioning government, low level of corruptions, and um, a robust welfare. Factors that Finns have a great appreciation for. Well, I think I have, I have had the opportunities to do what I want. I have a good education. I can raise my child in here quite safely, I think. So that, that is maybe the most important thing for me right now. We all are, are for now a welfare state and that we have quite strong um, equality here. But this is of course something that, uh, for example, our current uh, government is trying to run down. So I think this is something that we would really need to fight to still keep. Such appreciation may be in shorter supply in the United States and Germany, which aren't among the happiest nations, ranking 23rd and 24th respectively. Germany is also one of the countries in which older people are now happier than those under 30. Afghanistan is at the bottom of the table, amid a humanitarian crisis after the Taliban regained control. But goodwill remains universal. The report found that in our post-COVID world, acts of kindness are on the rise across the generations, giving us all something to smile about. Frank Martella is an assistant professor at Aalto University in Finland. He's an expert on happiness and well-being research and a philosopher. Welcome to DW, Frank. Thanks so much for joining us today. Now, your country has been crowned the happiest in the world for the seventh consecutive year, so I'm presuming you must be feeling quite happy right now. <laughs> I guess like, that's true, but I guess the like, Finnish people, first time that Finland once crowned the happiest, Nation Finnish people were not happy. Actually, they were quite much saying that there must be something wrong with the survey because I guess like the Finnish people don't think of themselves as particularly happy bunch of people. We have like this more melancholic, quiet self-image and being the happiest didn't fit with that. Okay, but we heard in that report, didn't we, people saying, you know, I can do everything that I want to do, we live in a welfare state, I can bring up my child here without worrying. So obviously there's a lot of factors in Finland that seem to, that seem to work and make people feel good. Yes, exactly. And I'm kind of like saying that it's not that the government will make citizens happy, but it's more that the well-functioning government is able to remove many sources of unhappiness. So it means that, you know, there's like less... There's not like more extremely happy people in Finland, but there's less extremely unhappy people in Finland. And that's quite much due to the well-functioning institutions and the, and the government taking care of the citizens. OK. How can we be sure, though, that, that all the findings in this report are valid? Because, of course, many of the factors that influence our happiness can, can vary, can change from day to day, can't they? I mean, you know, maybe you've slept well or you're in love or whether you've missed the bus. I mean, how accurate is all of this? So I guess, like, of course, on an individual level, there's like this daily variation but that's the point that because of that, they like survey more than 1,000 people in every country. So all of these individual variations would balance each other out. And through that, we get like this national average, which of course, there's always going to be, it's not going to be perfect. There's always going to be some margin of error, but still it 
gives a pretty accurate picture of how well the people are doing in a certain country. OK. Now, one point the report does make is that young people in the US and in Western Europe are increasingly unhappy, whereas in other parts of the world the opposite is true. So how would you explain those regional differences? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting finding. And it might be the case that in some many countries, like the future looks better than it used to be, that you feel that, you know, the young people feel that they're going to have a better life than their parents. But I guess in the US and in many Western European countries, that's not the case for the young people. They actually feel that they might not have like as good outlook as their parents used to have. And that might let them bring down their levels of life satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Do you think that people's happiness should be taken into account more in, in politics in the same way as economic forecasts, for example, or uh, unemployment figures? Yes, I think so, because like, what is the ultimate point of having governments or having like societies? I think one key point is that they try to make the lives of the citizens better. And if you want to know whether they're succeed, successful in that, then we, we should be measuring how well the citizens are doing in a country. So in that sense, I think the well-being indexes and happiness reports might be like even more important than the economic indicators, because economics is always just an instrument for something else. But kind of happiness is kind of the goal that the economics is trying to bring forward. OK. And I'd like to ask you, I mean, is there one particular point made in this new happiness report that gives you particular hope for the future? I like the fact that that is helping other people. It, it seems to be a quite robust thing and something that is taking place all over the world, because that reminds us that despite all the differences, the human beings are in the end quite helpful and pro-social and caring people who like, like to help other people. So let's hope that that's something that we take away from this report. Sounds good to me. Frank Martella, philosopher from the Aalto University in Finland. Thank you so much for, your, uh, for joining you. us today. Judith Mangelsdorf is in the studio with me now. She is Germany's first professor for positive psychology. She teaches at the German University for Health and Sport here in Berlin. Welcome, Professor. I have a million questions for you, <laughs> including what the study of positive psychology is, but we have limited time, so let's get straight to the issue. The four happiest countries in the world are all Nordic countries, I'm sure you've noticed. Finland, Denmark, Iceland, Sweden, what are they doing better than the rest of us? Mm -hmm. Basically, they all rank very high on the key indicators of a good life in society. Mm. So they are richer than many other countries in the world and they have this even distribution. But they also have uh, very close social networks and a very high level of social support. People are being there for each other. They have a high life expectancy and also a very healthy life expectancy, what makes a lot. And uh, what we see is that there is a high level of freedom there. So you are really free to make your own life choices and that contributes to a better life. And then we see um, a high level of generosity. So mm. people who are um, richer in the country are happy and more willing to contribute their wealth to the well-being of others. And there is a low level of corruption. And this is something that we see in all of these Scandinavian countries. You, you know, something you said at the beginning of this uh, really resonates with me because I've been seeing more and more reports about how connectivity to people really is what provides happiness at the end of the day, well beyond riches, what you have in your bank account. But let me, let me move on. We're both sitting here in Berlin. So I have to point out that Germany has slipped significantly in, right. the, in the rankings from 16th to 24th. Should we take that at face value? Does that basically mean that we're less happy in Germany than we used to be? Well, um, not really, because um, the difference uh, from the German ranking from last year to this year um, is not due to a uh, really uh, steep decline in self-reported um, life satisfaction here, mm -hmm. but is more an indicator of more um, self reported um, life satisfaction and happiness in other um, Eastern European countries. So basically other countries moved up and therefore the US and also Germany moved down in the ranking, but not because of a very um, steep decline in their own, uh, in their own value. I see. Well, in Germany, but also in other large countries, including the US and Australia, um, it's noticeable that people under 30 mm -hmm are significantly less happy than older people. Right. How do you explain this? 
Well, um, this is really something um, that is hard to explain because there are different factors coming together. So one is that all of these societies basically um, very much favor the needs of older generations. Um, that is one part of it. And on the other hand, what we have is that um, we have this mental health crisis that is significantly more um, important or like more pronounced in the younger generations. So the increase in depression and anxiety is something that we basically see a lot uh, on, uh, with people under 30 years. I want to pick up on, on something else that also came up in this report, and I want to get it right here. Um, since the COVID pandemic, people have been more supportive of each other, according right. to this report. They're even more willing to help strangers. Yeah. How do you explain that? What do you well, make of that? Yeah. <laughs> so um, to matter is one of the key indicators of a good life and something that um, really contributes to happiness. And especially in um, like social systems where there is a lot of responsibility on the government, um, people feel that they don't really matter anymore. So if I contribute to your happiness when there is a country that takes care of everything, like my contribution isn't as important. But especially with the uh, um, COVID pandemic, what we saw is we are important. Our contribution matters. And this is something that in increased benevolence across the whole globe and across all great age groups. And actually what is like most encouraging is that this effect um, didn't went back after the end of the pandemic, but that it continues to now. I want to end on the beginning. Mm -hmm. We talked about the Nordic countries, those countries up north. We all want to be happy. So our governments, as far as you can see, are they doing anything active to implement some of the things that we're seeing in those very happy Nordic countries? Well, I think there are many initiatives that try to move in this direction. What is missing right now is like um, to make it really one of the key points of the political agenda. So not just to have different initiatives that try to do something, but to make it something that is one of the most important political issues that we should um, face for and contribute to. That is uh, Judith uh, Mangelsdorf. Um, Many, many thanks, and thank you for ending it on a very happy note and for bringing your smile to the set. Thank you.